good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Jeff Diesel for having us here. I look forward to hearing the discussion from, from some of the physicians about one of the things with phase one is going to be quote unquote elective procedures returning to the hospitals. CDC had recommended about two months ago or certainly six, six, seven weeks ago that governors freeze quote elective procedures Part of the reason they wanted to do that was to make sure there was enough hospital space, which um, just from the data, I thought that we would have that, but then they were also concerned about a lack of PPE. And at that time, there was a real concern about that. So, so we ended up doing it, that as we've gone through this, as hospitals have had more than enough capacity, there's obviously a need to, to bring that online. So, so that's gonna start tomorrow. Some of the docs are gonna talk about what all that means. These are really important things for, for people's health. And, um, and, and we wanna make sure that the people understand that, that this is something that they're gonna be able to schedule going forward. In terms of uh, what's happened here in Volusia County, I think if you look, you go back the last uh, week to 10 days, uh, you've had two times where there have been a significant, you know, anything out of the ordinary with cases reported, and those were both connected uh, to, to the prison here. Uh, you both have inmates and staff. That obviously is an issue. It's a separate issue from kind of how it's going in the community, I think. But if you look at April 24th, there were 10 new cases, then four cases, three, seven, three, four. You did have the 46 with the prison on the 30th, and then seven and seven. And the uh, percent positive has pretty much been in the last week to 10 days in that 1.5 to 2%, um, accepting the, the, the prison um, dump when they had the prison stuff. If you look at the syndromatic indicators for Volusia, um, everything's trended downward in terms of the admissions uh, to the hospital. So I think that uh, the community here has handled it well. I know Jeff can talk a little bit about how, how they how they did it, how they've done. I know we're gonna hear about the, how they treated. Uh, they really did a good thing here. Uh, and I'll let them talk about kind of creating a separate containment unit. We have a, one of the biggest problems we've seen in the last six weeks is people that have heart problems or stroke symptoms deciding they don't want to go to the hospital. And sometimes that is because that they're worried about being exposed to COVID. Uh, I think you'll hear what Halifax did. There's really no chance of that because of how they've segregated the units. But it's certainly important for people, if, if you do have those, the hospital's a safe place to be. Uh, and taking care of yourself is very, very important. I'm, I'm finally pleased to be able to say testing has been a big part of what we're doing, but diagnostic testing is not the whole thing. You can go and test negative today. Doesn't mean you can't acquire the virus two days from now or three days from now. Uh, and so it is a part of it, but it's not the entire part. What you also need to have is serological testing, antibody testing. That is testing that will determine whether somebody has the antibodies that would be associated with having had the disease. And what they're finding throughout the country in places like Santa Clara, California, University of Miami did a study in Miami-Dade, New York is doing this, is that the number of people with the antibodies far exceeds the number of people who've actually tested positive in a diagnostic test. And so that has implications for how you deal with the epidemic going forward. So, I thought this was really, really important for Florida. We have a bunch of these things coming in from the, all kinds of sources, but we finally got our first 200,000 in at three o'clock in the morning. I've been bugging Department of Emergency Management, Department of Health for a long time for that. So, so they have 200,000 and those are gonna be deployed in the coming days. It'll probably be a, um, a combination of providing some to hospitals so that the healthcare workers can, can get tested, doing a lane in our drive-through test sites so that if people do want to get the antibodies, they can come in and get the antibody testing. But then there is gonna to need to be, and we may partner with universities on this, there needs to be some scientifically representative sample testing. So you go in different parts of the state, create a scientifically representative sample, test for the antibodies, and then see how prevalent those are in various parts of the state. The Miami study suggested that at the time, I think Dade County had 10,000 confirmed positive tests. Uh, they think it was antibodies about 160,000. So that's obviously several, several times more. 
So we want to know what how that is in other parts of the state of Florida. And I don't know that the antibodies, I think, I think you'll definitely see some divergence there, just as we've seen divergence with the epidemic overall. Uh, but I do think the antibody test is important. And then if you're somebody in healthcare that has the antibodies, you're going to want to know that. That's going to be very helpful. Certain workers in other sectors that have the antibodies are going to be very, very helpful. Uh, pretty much everyone agrees it's, it, it confers uh, some level of immunity. People don't know how long. Uh, some have said maybe as slow as six months, maybe two years. I think scientists will figure that out, but clearly it's a benefit to have the, the antibodies. We're going to continue doing our drive-through sites as we get into phase one, these test sites. We have uh, now we're supporting or running in conjunction with the National Guard uh, 11 drive-through sites and we have plans to open more. And the thought is, is that if people, someone goes to work and they have a symptom, that they know there's an easy place they can go. This is not going to even be close to all the testing because you have medical providers are doing more and more, private sectors doing a lot of stuff, uh, but we do think it's important. So I was just in the panhandle. They haven't had a, a huge epidemic there, but we're putting one there in Escambia County to be able to serve those folks. One of the things that we're seeing that's been effective are our walkthrough sites or we'll actually go into commu underserved communities, set up sites where people can walk up and get tested. We're probably gonna wanna fold some antibody testing into the walk-up sites, but we see those in different regions of the state of Florida. This is something that we've started within the last few weeks, and they've already done, uh, they've completed 12,000 tests uh, for those walk-up sites, which is very, very important. We, Jeff and I talked, uh, and, and some of the, the docs talked about how important it is to safeguard nursing homes. And as part of this rollout of the, not, of the uh, quote, elective surgeries, the hospitals, when they're doing it, they're certifying effectively that they do have space in the hospital, that if you did have increase in COVID patients, they could handle it, that they have adequate PPE, they're not gonna run to the state for more PPE. But then we're also, uh, asking that everyone play a constructive role in helping our nursing home residents. And, and what, what they did in Halifax is exactly the best practice that Secretary Mayhew has been talking about from the beginning. From the very beginning, she was worried about uh, hospitals sending in COVID patients back into a nursing home and then infecting all the other places there. Uh, what, what Jeff is doing is that if somebody comes in with COVID in a nursing home, they need two positive tests before they're sent back so that we have confidence that they're not going to infect other people. If they come in for a non-COVID reason, they're still given a test before they get sent back to the nursing home. I'll let them talk a little bit more, but that is basically what we wanna see uh, for all the healthcare providers. I think you are seeing that by and large. I know Cleveland Clinic is doing something similar, but that is a way to help fight the epidemic and that's a huge, huge thing. But we have National Guard, I have 50 National Guard units going into nursing homes and offering testing, residents and staff. And what's happened is we found more positive cases doing that, uh, but a lot of these cases were asymptomatic. And so then you're able to contain the cluster uh, as it develops. And that, that keeps it, because if, if these things are left to spread unabated in a nursing home, this thing can really spread like wildfire. So we appreciate the guard doing that. We're gonna roll out this week a mobile lab inside of an RV. Uh, the lab is going to be able to do the 45 minute test. So we're going to have 3,500 tests a week and we're going to go to different long-term care facilities to start, uh, offer these tests and then um, be able to get results back very, very quickly. So that's a huge, huge thing. And I want to thank the White House helped us getting these 45 minute tests for this mobile RV lab. And so I think that that's going to be something that's good. So we'll have an announcement on that when it's ready to roll, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. The state supported testing, hospital testing uh, is great, but there's more private sector actors that are getting involved in this. Uh, I recently signed an executive order to allow licensed pharmacists to conduct COVID tests. So Walgreens has announced that they're gonna uh, do nine drive-through sites in Florida. So they're gonna have one in Hillsborough County, one in Volusia County in Orange City, one in Opelika in Miami-Dade, one in Miami proper in Miami-Dade, Winter Garden in, in, in the Orlando, Orange County area, 
uh, Orlando proper, and then Jupiter and Palm Beach County. Uh, they probably will end up doing some more, but that's good. So there'll be one here um, in the western part of, of or, uh, in the western part of Volusia County. CVS is going to announce plans soon. Uh, so Walgreens, CVS, that's very, very convenient for a lot of people. And then by early next week, Walmart plans to have five drive-through sites throughout the state. And so I know there'll be an announcement on that forthcoming. So we are continuing to stress the need for testing and building a, a really strong infrastructure. We, nobody really knows what the shape the, the epidemic is going to take. As we go into phase one, um, you know, we just have to wait and see and look at the data. Uh, there's some people that think that we've kind of gotten through this as a country, that it, that it may subside and then really come back in the fall. Uh, well, if that happens, we're going to have a much better infrastructure put in place uh, than the country had in February and early March. And so there's new products coming online all the time, new technologies coming on all the time. I mean, just going back two or three weeks from today, there's so much more available uh, than there even was. And then as you were getting through March and into April, it seems like there was a new emergency use authorization almost every other day from the FDA. So the private sector has really gotten involved in this um, and is really pushing out a lot of great products. So we're gonna just continue to do uh, what we need to do to be able to build that good infrastructure. But I, I'm happy to be here to talk about this really important component about getting into phase one as a state and I know that this is going to help the, the, the health of a lot of people in the state of Florida, and it's also going to help uh, the hospitals function. What a lot of people don't uh, recognize is we took a lot of these actions to be able to prevent the hospitals from being overwhelmed. That obviously has succeeded. We have not seen that in Florida, but because all these other things were not happening, uh, a lot of hospitals had to furlough workers, and so some of the capacity was actually diminished on the back end, so this will allow kind of a system to start running again like it should and obviously it'll be good for people's health. So I'm going to kick it over to Jeff, let him say um, say a few things about these surgeries and you can touch on how you guys have handled the nursing home patients. I think that'd be good too. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, Governor, thank you for your leadership through uh, the last 45 days and beyond. You've done an excellent job and uh, one of those areas is the nursing homes and some of the, the mandates that were put down, keeping the nursing homes closed to visitation um, because once uh, once this uh, virus gets into the nursing homes, it does spread like wildfire, and it's tough for families to not be able to see their loved ones, but I can tell you that uh, it has worked here in Volusia County, and um, as a result of that, overall, we're seeing a very light number of cases here. At any given day, we have six to seven patients in our biocontainment unit, and I'll have Dr. Harmon speak to what our biocontainment unit is. Um, we've seen six deaths here in Halifax. We've treated or tested over a thousand uh, of our patients here, utilizing uh, both commercial testing in the Cephe platform that the governor spoke to, the 45 minute turnaround. We're prioritizing the, that type of testing for patients presenting to the emergency room that are symptomatic, as well as our workforce. And um, if you look at the workforce here at Halifax, we, we have approximately 4,400 team members somewhat of a small city. And even within our workforce in the hospital environment, and this is an attestation to the fact that the hospital is a safe place to be. Um, we've seen very, very little um, numbers of our patients or our employees that have tested positive for this, this virus. So it's, uh, that is an attestation to our environmental services and our infection control teams that the, the, that are doing the sanitation that the hospital is a safe place to come and be. So. Uh, don't stay away if you are ill. Uh, our emergency room volumes are approximately 50% of what they typically would run. That says that people aren't utilizing the emergency room as they at least traditionally um, done. So we encourage you if you have symptoms, whether it's COVID symptoms, stroke symptoms, heart attack symptoms, that you, you get to the hospital. Um, the, uh, the surgery portion, we are uh, ready to open up tomorrow. There, we do have a backlog of elective surgeries that have taken place. We have continued to do emergent surgeries, such as heart bypass, um, neurosurgery, trauma surgery, obviously, that, that needs to take place. But there's also emergency appendectomies. So 
Uh, Dr. Fieser here is, uh, is a part of our surgical task force that is um, analyzing uh, the surgeries that need to take place as well as developing procedures um, as we go forward how to safely reopen. On a typical day, we would have approximately 80 procedures taking place across our system. Tomorrow, we're scheduled to open up with, with uh, 25 elective procedures to kind of ease back into it, and that ramps up to uh, approximately 40 um, on Tuesday. And we'll, we'll also have emergency, probably another 20 to 30 emergency surgeries. So we are, we're happy to, to open up the doors to our um, elective procedures and hopefully get things back to a, a semi-normal state and um, see how things go. Dr. Fieser, did you want to speak to the procedures that uh, we put in place to make sure that we're opening up safely? Um, sure, yeah. Um, first, I'd like to echo Jeff's sentiments. Uh, Governor, thank you for your leadership, your clarity with your messages, and your transparency with all the data that you have uh, for giving to us as a medical community and the public at large. Um, it's nice to get back to elective surgery tomorrow. Uh, I think through working with the hospital, we have a great uh, approach, uh, making sure that everyone's going to be treated safely, uh, everyone's being screened at certain checkpoints several days before surgery, then when they come in the building, uh, we have visitation guidelines to make sure that the hospital stays as safe as it is now, uh, that the patients are cared for safely. Um, but our message is uh, to get all the patients, uh, if you need surgery, now is, now is as safe as ever. Uh, we can do it safely and we're gonna uh, open up tomorrow morning, uh, reduced uh, volumes, but uh, ramping up appropriately um, over the next couple of days to weeks. What, um, can you just speak about like the, the gamut of procedures that would be considered quote unquote elective and then um, I mean because I think sometimes people hear elective and think unnecessary. Uh, yes sir um, absolutely so uh, for instance tomorrow I've got the, some of the operative schedules uh, things like aneurysm surgery, limb salvage surgery, heart bypass, uh, even some cancer procedures that maybe the providers over the past couple weeks have decided that in the interest of public health and the patient safety and the staff safety to delay a couple of weeks uh, it's now time to do those procedures and so uh, not the trauma emergencies which we've always done throughout this whole uh, ordeal um, but the things that are urgent, so heart bypass, leg bypass, aneurysm surgery, uh, maybe a symptomatic gallbladder, symptomatic hernias, and things like that, uh, now are safe to do. Great. And then, um, Dr. Harmon, can you talk about how you have, um, uh, talk about your unit and how you guys have handled uh, the COVID uh, patients that come in? So, sure. Um, and I'd also like to thank you for coming by and seeing us firsthand and means a lot to us. Yeah, so um, Dr. Stephen Veal actually runs our emergency department, and um, he's got quite a bit of training in public health as well, and, and he and Alberto Tenillo, our COO, uh, designed a space in the hospital on the ground floor that separated considerably from the rest of the hospital, sort of tucked between some warehouse areas and shipping platforms. But it's nowhere near the main hospital, and it was, it was turned into a negative pressure room um, by the strategic use of fans and vents. And uh, this was all prepared prior to our first patient. So on that Saturday, about six or seven weeks ago, when we got our first two patients, we had a place to bring them into the hospital without even going through the main part of the hospital. We've got a rear entrance that comes directly into that unit. And, um, you know, I won't lie to you, um, we invented some of it as we went along because we've never handled anything like this before. But at least the basic unit was established and it worked out very well. And um, uh, a cadre of nurses and respiratory therapists and environmental services people um, stepped up and, and volunteered to work in that unit. So we have kept the people who work in that unit separate from the main staff that work in the hospital. Um, my intensive service has uh, 10 people, but only two of us work in the uh, COVID unit. So there's two of us that are exposed daily um, to the virus, but we've kept that to a minimum so that the remainder of uh, my crew um, can work among the hospital and continue to um, run the intensive care units like they've always done. But as we, as we came along, we, we uh, and Stephen Veal and Alberta uh, designed a dining area for PPE and that sort of stuff, and then, you know, good flow through the room, then a docking area where all contaminated material is uh, removed, and changing areas and lockers, and a considerable hallway that one traverses to even get into this area. 
Um, and like I said, we all come and go through separate doorways. Uh, so this is, as a matter of fact, the vast majority of people that work at this hospital don't know where this unit is. That's how hit it is. We, we didn't hide it on purpose. It just turned out to be the most strategic place for it. And I think the most rewarding thing is that we haven't seen the spread among employees elsewhere in the hospital at all. And we haven't had any of the people that have worked in the COVID unit become infected. So, so clearly the PPE that we're using uh, is sufficient and adequate. And this, is, this, this has been a little over six weeks now, so it's, it's way past the incubation period for a COVID virus infection. And if people were um, using inadequate protection, we would, we would know it well by now, and that has not been a problem. Um, I assume I'm a carrier, so I take extra precautions and so forth just because I'm exposed daily as do the other people that work in that unit. But we were blessed in that we got two patients initially and then they trickled in and the census in the unit usually runs in single digits. Um, and we've got quite a routine 24 hours a day there um, that, that functions very well and safely. And we, so we were to a point that if there were to be a surge at some point, we can handle a heck of a lot more patients. We could easily handle 20 to 25 patients in that unit if we had to, but in reality, we usually, today we have seven patients in the unit, we have one ventilator. Um, another comment I'd like to make is that, um, um, aside from the fact that this is really separated from the main hospital, um, is that, now, I, I, I'm not an epidemiologist, and I can only speak from my experience here. But I have yet to have an otherwise healthy, middle-aged person come in and end up on a ventilator. Um, and, and you can be a bit overwhelmed by, by news stories. And um, I'm not pro or con any particular network or anything, but you, you can be a bit overwhelmed. And, and the simple fact of the matter is that literally everybody that is given this trouble had pre-existing conditions. Um, usually nursing home patients, usually elderly, late 80s, um, early 90s, um, and frequently a period of decline prior to this particular infection. Uh, in some cases, they weren't even seriously enough ill from the COVID virus to be a problem, but we had to isolate them because there were no other places for these patients to be housed until we made arrangements to test everybody twice before they returned to a, a nursing home. Um, but the units worked out real well for us, and like I said, I can only speak from my personal experience, and uh, we have all the resources we need, and we have from the very start. We, we, we're kind of spoiled down there, actually. We get whatever we want, and, um, and, and clearly, we wanted this to be successful. Um, and it, it's really, the person who really took leadership on this actually is Dr. Stephen Beal. He, he's really the one with the public health experience who really set this up, and, um, and and I had to show up and take the field, basically, but but there were a lot of people here, and, and, and certainly in environmental services that helped us create this room and so forth, and and, and Mr. Tenio is uh, with me on a daily basis going over everything from this room and so forth, but, but we have not been overwhelmed by a surge at any time, um, and, uh, we have not faced any shortages. We have not lacked for any equipment. And having done this for over six weeks, I, I feel very comfortable as the director of critical care here saying that it's certainly perfectly safe to come to the hospital and have elective procedures done and so forth. So I think we've proved that we've isolated the COVID unit from the rest of the hospital. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, Dr. Kipkin, do you want to talk about um, just generally about, I think you had made some comments about people when they have different conditions, what they should be doing, and um, obviously I think there's been a lot of discussion on the safety here, but maybe to reiterate that and any other thoughts you think are important. Sure, and, and I also want to reiterate, thank you. Um, I really appreciate, and as a scientist, we all do, uh, leading by facts and not fear. So I really appreciated you taking that um, stance as you began this uh, discussion and moving into phase one. And as my colleagues have said, and Mr. Fiesel, uh, we have a whole team of very talented individuals. Uh, one of the ones I just want to mention is Ralph, uh, Ralph uh, excuse me, uh, Jacob, sorry. 
Jacob, who's our engineer, who just did an amazing job getting, uh, getting these negative pressure rooms and areas up and running. And we just had a whole team of talented individuals from the top to bottom, from one side to the other, who have created this, uh, this environment where you can feel comfortable, you can feel safe coming in. You know, when you come into the hospital, one of the things I want to let everyone know is you're going to be seeing people in masks as we were when we came in. Um, and you will, you will be cared for by individuals wearing masks. And when you come to the door as a patient, uh, you will have basic strategic questions asked of you. We're still screening, doing uh, particular questions to screen for your risk factors for COVID. We're looking for symptoms, tem temperature checks. Uh, we're doing a lot of the retooling that a lot of the businesses out in our community have had to do, quite honestly, and even more. And we're experts at uh, working in isolating and quarantining rep uh, uh, positions. So we know what we're doing here. We've had the luxury of time, six weeks, to work on making sure that we have uh, taken our policies and made them COVID informed is the way I like to look at that. And so everything we do throughout the institution is designed to keep you safe, to take the best care of our patients. And I will also add that um, our physicians who've been on the front lines caring for these patients have collaborated not only among themselves here in the enterprise, but also across the country and across the world, quite honestly, making sure that they're staying abreast of what the latest information is. Uh, we like the data, we like the facts, we like trying to incorporate that and not just fly off, off, off on tangents. We believe uh, that the care that we've been giving has been superb. We've had some terrific outcomes. And I really appreciate Dr. Harmon speaking to some of those specific situations. Um, so as far as what we need to do, you know, and part of your uh, impetus has been to just educate everybody. Educate about the facts and then what we do know and what we have learned. And it's so important to incorporate those things as we step back into this phase one. Because if we will continue to social distance, if we will continue with our hand hygiene, all of these things we've been talking about, we need to make sure that we've taken steps to protect the more vulnerable. And if you are among the less vulnerable, we've been talking about who tends to be more or less vulnerable. If you're among the less vulnerable, we certainly want to be considerate of those who may be more vulnerable. And we may or may not exactly know who they are. It could be someone who is your same age, but has a lot of illnesses that you may or may not know about. So I'm really impressed and proud for the way Florida has stepped up how this community has stepped up, this county has stepped up, our officials have stepped up and said, let's move forward with education, let's inform this community and step forward in the best, most conscientious, courteous, respectful way possible and let's get back to life. Great, well I wanna thank everybody for, for all your hard work and I'm excited that you're gonna be getting some of these procedures going again. I think it's gonna be good for the health of folks throughout uh, th throughout the, the Volusia County region, obviously throughout the state of Florida. So, you know, as we're going into phase one, we believe in, in doing safe, smart, step-by-step -step approach. There's not, it's not that there's gonna be an earth shattering difference between phase one and what we've been doing. I mean, we're deliberately going, we're gonna be cautious. This obviously is, is very important. I don't know in kind of like the general public, they're not necessarily gonna see the difference because they're not coming to the hospital every day, but that will be obviously an important difference. Some of the other things in terms of some of the, the businesses and, um, and whatnot, you know, you know, small steps, uh, not terribly different from some of the other stuff we've done. In fact, we've had retail open, Home Depot, all this, obviously people have been going to grocery stores. So uh, it, it's designed that way. And I know there's some folks who saying, hey, just flip the switch and, and just go be done with it. Um, but you know, the country has never gone handled an epidemic like we handled this one. Uh, they didn't in 18, 57, 68, if you look at those pandemics. So, so nobody really knows, uh, and anyone that tells you they know for sure, you know, they're not being honest. So, so I think that's why being safe, smart, and step-by-step -step is the appropriate way to consider that. And um, I think we're gonna respond well, and I think we're gonna be able to continue to take some good steps. But uh, tomorrow is just, just one step. It, it's certainly not the Florida that we had in February, but uh, I think that we obviously want to get uh, get to where we're, we're back in the saddle doing a lot of great things. So so thank you guys for all you're doing and I'll uh, be happy to take a few questions before I leave. Dr. Hunter, is the DOE addressing the thousands of applicants who said they meet all the requirements, demands to qualify for benefits, but still have to be ineligible? 
Well, the Department of Education is DOE. They don't do unemployment. That's DEO. Yeah, DEO. Um, so what I'm going to do tomorrow is we are going to do my my press conference is going to focus on everything having to do with this and. Um, and we're going to run through because I think uh, clearly you're starting. I mean, they've now processed 700 million. I think they're at now. And they're doing this all weekend. They've paid 450,000 claimants. Probably there'll be more as we go in. And so I think people. Uh, and it's been very tough because it's a sudden, abrupt change in the economy. And I know this is very difficult for a lot of people. Uh, the, the system just totally broke. It's not a good system. We're going to deal with that. But we had to make all these changes and really just 24-7. So, so that money's going out. I think the, the questions we get now more than anything is, hey, I applied, but I'm not, I was deemed ineligible or my application. So they're going to address that and show kind of some of the different things that, that may be troubleshooting. If you don't qualify for unemployment benefits, and for, I mean, just if someone wasn't working at all or seeking employment, then they're not going to qualify for unemployment. There are other forms of relief under the Federal CARES Act. So we're going to outline all of that tomorrow, provide the most up-to-date statistics on how much money has been paid out, and, and hope to answer a lot of those questions. So I'm going to have the, the Secretary of DMS, who I put in uh, because we needed to get these changes done quicker. Uh, to, to run the unemployment, he's going to be there, and I think people should tune in. I think that that will be very helpful, and I would say the, the agency has been very proactive. If somebody is quoted in the newspaper saying, hey, I, don't, I haven't got my stuff, they actually will go and they will try to identify, okay, who's the person, look them up in the system and see what the deal is. And if they see somebody uh, talking on even social media, sometimes they'll find people and they will go and do this. I can tell you most of the cases that they're finding are no social security number, uh, out of state weight. There's just a bunch of different things. So I think it's going to be helpful to just kind of do a big run through, let everyone know where we're at. I think the progress, given how bad the system was, um, people have worked really hard. Uh, we still got more work to do, but I think it'll be helpful. So that'll be tomorrow, and I think people, if they're interested, should definitely tune in. Governor, on the subject of antibody testing, um, what companies do So we sourced from the FDA approved test. I don't know the company's name, but they're, they, I think they sent the test to New York first, and then they sent it to us. The Surgeon General of Florida was adamant that you only do FDA approved because uh, what you'll find is the, the COVID-19, the, the virus that causes COVID-19 is a coronavirus. It's not the only coronavirus. If the test doesn't have the specificity, then I could get test positive for antibodies for the common cold, for example. Well, that obviously isn't helping us identify this. So yeah, this is an FDA approved test. It will distinguish, at least FDA says, between the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 and other coronaviruses. So that's very important to do. We also have another company in Florida that we have an agreement with that is waiting for the emergency use authorization from the FDA. Obviously, we're, we're gonna wanna see that before we put that into, into practice, but it's a very important thing. If you, if you don't have a, a, an antibody test that can distinguish the validity of what we can extrapolate from that, it, it's just not there. Governor, does it concern you that these companies, given the fast track with the FDA, they simply submit a form, sign it, and the company just attests that it works and it's accurate and they've tested it? Well, I think there's more to that. I mean, they're really going through a lot. If you look at what they did with Remsdevere, that had been going on, and I'm not saying Remsdevere is going to be effective. Uh, if you look at what they did uh, with some of these Abbott lab tests, this is something that, that they do look at, but what they do is, they're fast, anything with coronavirus, they are fast tracking. So if somebody, some reputable company has a new test, that is gonna be reviewed immediately by the FDA, whereas normally that would take forever and a day even just get your foot in the door. So, so I really appreciate it. Dr. Hahn, who's the commissioner, uh, has been really, really great to deal with. Anytime we have an issue, like I can call him directly and he's very responsive and he's working really, really hard. So I think they're doing it the best way that they can. You obviously have to review this stuff. You can't just willy nilly say, throw products out. At the same time, lives are at stake. And so if you let the bureaucracy grind this process to a halt, 
then you're going to be missing opportunities to potentially help people. So I don't think it's a per any perfect solution, but I think they probably struck the balance as good as you can. Are you planning to do any blood draws to then test that, to then get those other... So we actually, uh, the Department of Health is working with one blood. As people give blood normally, uh, we think that you'd be able to screen for the antibodies. So you may end up with a situation where the X number of people have given from one part of the state and we can see what percentage actually has the antibodies. That will be interesting from just a general societal perspective. It wouldn't be a scientifically valid representative sample, but I think it would be an indication. So yeah, we're gonna do that as well. And I would also remind people uh, out there, uh, if you have had COVID and you've recovered, uh, and you give the blood, uh, they can then use those antibodies for this plasma treatment, which a lot of physicians have, have had very good results with. So you have an opportunity to kind of help other people uh, who may develop this disease in the future uh, if you're willing to donate the blood. And then once we do the antibody testing, then there's gonna, because a lot of the people, if you look at all those antibody results, the inescapable conclusion is a lot of people have had this and don't even know they've had it because they just either never developed symptoms at all or the symptoms were so mild it was not anything you would even think of. When you're in Santa Clara and Stanford is saying 50 to 80 times more people have the antibodies that have tested positive in Santa Clara, uh, that obviously is really significant. New York, you look, you know, you're talking about, I mean, they have more cases than anyone, documented cases, but I think there are like 300 and some thousand but they probably, they have several million according to those antibodies um, just in the, in the city, I think, alone. So that's really, really significant to know. Two more questions, please. Over Governor, here. you yeah. spoke a little bit about the different things that the state is doing to try and protect people in nursing homes, but is there anything else that you think that the state could do or that they're working on? Because we're continuing to see people in nursing homes die. I think last I checked, it was around uh, it was over 400 deaths related to nursing homes. Right, right, but you have to also put that in perspective. We have 2 million more people than New York, for example, an older population. They've had thousands and thousands of nursing home deaths. So what we've done has been able to reduce what I think would be expected in terms of the fatalities significantly. Our death rate in long-term care facilities is way less than New York, New Jersey, all those other places and many other places across the country. The problem there's a couple problems. One is the screening that we put in Im immediately, not every facility followed it. So there were sick workers who were allowed to go in and do the work. Well, this is a contagious uh, illness, and so you ended up having outbreaks. Uh, then we started to see asymptomatic staff members. They, they passed the screening. They didn't have a fever. They didn't, they didn't, they necessarily didn't have contact, at least no contact with people who had it. Uh, but then you'd go in place like Suwannee uh, County had a one where you had dozens of staff and a lot of them didn't even know they were sick and then that spreads to the residents. So one of the reasons we're doing so much of resources on National Guard for the nursing homes is uh, we want to be able to identify people who are asymptomatic, identify who they've been working with, and then segregate that cluster so it doesn't just continue to spread to the nursing homes. Uh, We've done a bunch of testing. Um, I think it's been effective. Uh, but then with this RV, to be able to go in a mobile way, run the test, get the results, and then immediately isolate any staff that may be infected, you know, that's a huge, huge force multiplier. So that's gonna be coming online in a few days. We're gonna do a big uh, announcement for that. If you look at the epidemic in Florida, we're certainly outside of Southeast Florida, and you look at the numbers where Volusia is, where Brevard, a lot of these places, Orlando, Orange County has done a great job. Uh, you know, the, the overwhelming threat is really in these long-term care facilities. It's not permeating right now, knock on wood, hopefully that continues, uh, to where you have this virulent infections like you would have in New Jersey or some of these other places. So if the nursing homes, uh, we can continue to do things there, you know, that is going to be the tip of the sphere. And then yeah, I would say even in Southern Florida, it clearly has spread more in a place like Miami, uh, but you still have uh, a significant fraction of those fatalities are from, from those facilities. So very, very important. But one thing uh, that I would give our Healthcare Administration Secretary May, Mary Mayhew credit me, she, she has been a hawk on this since the very beginning. I mean, before anyone was even talking about this, 
you know, we understood this is where the vulnerability is. And she's worked with the hospital, she's worked with the facilities, and really, really done well. We're going to continue. And also Jared Moskowitz, who's the director of emergency management. You know, I told Jared, I said, look, obviously we've got to, if we have PPE, if a hospital worker needs it, we need to get a mask, we need to do all that. I was like, well, we've also got to get stuff to these folks working in the nursing homes. Because if you have protection of the staff and you prevent an outbreak, that's going to take stress off the hospitals. Because you have an outbreak in a nursing home, you're going to see people end up coming here. And obviously that's going to, going to add to the, the lab, that's going to reduce their capacity. Not that you want an outbreak anywhere, but you're seeing places where you're having outbreaks and 90% of the people are asymptomatic in some of the younger cohorts, some of the prison populations that you've seen, very few have had symptoms. And so the nursing home is where that. So we have sent out just from the state of Florida to long-term care facilities, 7 million masks, a million gloves and a half a million face shields just to those long-term care facilities. And I think that's, uh, we're requiring them to wear this stuff uh, a lot of them did have some, but they needed more. So we pushed out a lot. And I think that that's probably a very effective use of resources. What about the outbreaks in the prison? Phase one, and there's going to be close monitoring to how the situation behaves. What would be a possible scenario would you consider taking a few steps back into the situation that we currently So what we're going to do is we're going to monitor the hospital, uh, hospital capacity. That, the whole reason they did the mitigation was the fear of the hospitals being overwhelmed. And uh, if that were to happen, that obviously would lead to really bad health outcomes, not just for COVID, but for every, anything else. So we are gonna look to see, um, do you have a trend where hospitals are starting to get uh, overburdened? And if that is tied to anything that, that we're doing in terms of phase one. But I also wanna see if there's a connection to that. I mean, for example, you know, I view the nursing home problem as separate from whether businesses can reopen. Because if you're if you're doing things in the nursing home, um, you know, we know we have to keep people out of there. I mean, we know that. Um, and so, if there's an outbreak there, that may not be related to some of the other things that you're doing. The other thing we're going to look at, we're going to expand, continue to expand testing. As I've said repeatedly over the last week or so, this is just a fact. Our drive-through sites have fewer people go through than we have capacity to test by several thousand statewide. We could probably do another 2,500 um, statewide for that. Now, hopefully that's just because people aren't having symptoms. Maybe that's a really good sign, but we're gonna continue to expand opportunities. I do think you're gonna have more testing. I think more businesses are gonna wanna be involved. Obviously, I've talked about private sector like, like Walgreens. So you're gonna to start to, to, to get even more. We, we typically, if you look this past week, uh, yesterday we got about 15,000 test results, the day before almost 19,000, day before that 21,000. So we're gonna be in, I think, 20,000 to 30. We'll right up capacity to do even more. And so what I'm gonna be looking, and there's gonna be more cases that are gonna be found because we're testing more asymptomatic people now. When this started, CDC said only test 65 and up, who had traveled to China or no I mean, it was so restrictive. They've loosened it, but we've loosened it even more and said, you know, you don't have symptoms, you can come get tested. So what that will do, that will allow us to identify infected people who are very low risk for hospitalization or fatalities. Uh, but that's a good thing that we know that because that could be somebody that could spread it to one of the vulnerable populations. So we're gonna identify more cases as we go along. And I can already tell people that's gonna probably be spun in the media as, oh my gosh, Florida just had, you know, uh, like the other day, they had 995 new Florida cases on 430. Yeah, we tested 21,000 people that day and the percent positive was five. So we're gonna really be looking at that percent positive, you know, making sure that that's under 10%. We've had it so, Volusia is so low. I mean, when you're in the 1.7, 1.4, 2.2, 2.2, 1.7, other than the prison positives, I don't think Volusia has been over 3% um, since in, in about 10, 12 days. So that's a really good sign. So looking at the percent that tests positive, 
and then looking at um, the hospitalizations. And then we'll also look at things like the syndromatic indicators. We'll look at the influenza-like illness indicators and see how things are going. But, but fortunately, I think the trend, certainly on the syndromatic indicators, has been very positive statewide. Um, and we have so much hospital capacity statewide. I mean, even like Miami, which has 40% of our cases, you know, they, they typically have between 40 and 45% of their ICU beds have been empty this whole time. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at that, uh, but I really believe that you know, taking these smart, uh, safe and step-by-step -step approaches, it allows us to get the state back in a good direction without taking our eye off the ball with these vulnerable populations. And so all that continues, um, but I definitely think that you're gonna be able to do both. So I look back, I look forward to coming back here soon. We, um, I mean, man, I was here, the, the Daytona, you know, obviously the race got, got, uh, uh, got suspended the, the day I was here, they had a great next day. We wanna see Daytona back the way it was. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight, but I'm confident that we can get there. So everyone just hang in there and do your part. Thank you. Any decision on hair salons, reopening barbershops after your round table yesterday?